Grab my bitty and call me titty. It's Between Nerds. Hey guys, my name is Drew Philip Elias. I am the co-host of Between Nerds Podcast, and I am here with my other co-host, Mr. Aldo Mendez. What's up, buddy? What's up, brother? I am excellent. I just finished watching the 2003-2004 production of the 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 Wachowski's production of Animatrix. Yes, yes. Uh, this is a weird episode because we're not only digging into like American pop culture, and we are deviated from what we've been doing for this anime for the longest time, which is anime and Japanese pop culture and shit. We're, we're, we're still sort of doing anime, but you're right. We're we're trying to branch out a little bit. But one of my biggest fears that I've talked about with Aldo for this podcast is I don't want like yes we're between nerds but I don't want to talk about like redundant topics Marvel like, UMC shit right <laughs> like if you're gonna go watch MCU or the latest Venom breakdown you can go watch fucking uh, any YouTube a thousand channel thousand different yeah, there, there's channels. so many sources for that medium Mm -hmm. But a, a big thing that we've been into is we've been going into rabbit holes of, like, Japanese production, and we've been relating it to American sensibilities in production, because obviously we're fucking Americans, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, if yeah. you can't tell by the sound of my voice... And the world revol revolves around America. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Everyone's trying to emulate us, so I have to compare everything to what I know. And the Animatrix, to that point is a Warner Brothers studio production. It's an American production and it's a a like pre it, it's a it's an extension of the Wachowski's extended universe that was created during the Matrix trilogy, mm -hmm. but it takes into account like things that 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 this podcast has talked about, which is like Japanese production and animation storytelling right uh, right which like the animatrix for people that don't know is a film with a 100 minute runtime of like nine separate short parts done by different studios and it's telling different parts of the the matrix extended universe mm -hmm. but before i go down that rabbit hole i do want to plug ourselves so please nerds for the october giveaway please use hashtag Tits for nerds. That is T I T S F O R N E R D S. In an original tweet or Instagram post to be entered into our October giveaway. We will, at the end of the month, be drawing names and numbers out of a hat and send a lucky hashtag user some cool anime shit. And mm -hmm. the cool thing about that is we will be giving to uh, the Rio Grande Cancer Foundation at the end of the month for every total like and retweet. Mm -hmm. in posts that use hashtag tits for nerds and and again if you guys have any comments concerns any anything maybe you know something about a different rabbit hole that we haven't dived into of some weird japanese culture stuff just send it over we'll watch anything send us your favorite animes uh we have some plan but we always like to get your recommendations just so, so we can watch something new something out there which, which like to that point um our, our, our plans change weekly right like week to week like people have different schedules like there's different stuff going on sometimes we research like a season that's 50 episodes after we announce that we're gonna talk about it and to that point we had said today was going to be a dual feature between both the animatrix and star wars visions mm. I binge watched all nine episodes of Star Wars Visions this morning, and to be honest, the more like I watched it, I was like, I could really talk about this shit for two, three hours in and of itself. Uh -huh. and and the way and the and the reason we wanted to do a a double feature in that is because not only is a American media is getting a its its own Japanese rebirth or not rebirth, but Star, a, a, Star another Wars way to tell it. Star Wars Visions is kind of 2021 Animatrix. Mm -hmm. It is. Sort it is. of. You know what I mean? Like It, it is the same idea. It, they wanted to do the same thing, pretty much. Right. Mm -hmm. So, to that point, like we're still going to talk about Star Wars Visions. Don't get me wrong. Like I still have these two, three hours of thoughts like held up in my brain. But we're going to do it next week. Mm -hmm. And because I fucking suck at Googling like uh, season lengths for animes... I had said that next week was going to be Yu Yu Hakusho with Robi Quintela, mm -hmm. season two of Yu Yu Hakusho. But 
when I was in the office on Thursday, I Googled how long season two of Yu Yu Show was, and it's like 35 fucking episodes. Mm-hmm. And we, we can't do that in one week. I, I'm sorry, audience, for like the, the three people following, following us week to week, but our cap for a, a week it's of probably watching... probably 27, probably. Probably. 27 yeah. a week is like pushing it, too. Yeah. Like, that's... I, I'm on the Stairmaster, just like, holy shit, sure. this this episode of Yu Yu is crazy. Mm-hmm. But, um, so, that's how we're looking at the next couple weeks here. Mm-hmm. And I think we can go ahead and get into the Animatrix at that point. Absolutely. I guess some shit before, I mean, before jumping into this, I mean, the new Animatrix with Counter Reeves, is, I mean, the new Matrix with Counter <laughs> Reeves is coming out soon. Um, when this first came out, I, I don't know if you guys know much about the directors, the Wachowski sisters at this point. It was an oligarchy for, like, trans, uh, 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 uh like, your, 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 uh, what do you call it? Your pronouns and shit like that. Because they even talk about that in the first Matrix, when Agent Smith always calls him Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson. It's just such a, 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 a big idea that they were going through is that right yeah that is it's an oligarchy for like the pronouns usage and 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 identification okay as a gender okay okay i i never yeah. thought about the animatrix i the matrix i wow no i can't stop saying it i never thought about the original matrix trilogy like that mm-hmm. and i remember watching the original matrix trilogy this is like early 2090s oh, bro so like uh Blockbuster's still around. Mm-hmm. I, I remember that's how I entirely watched parts two and part three of The Matrix. It was just like, yeah, I come from a divorced family. Like, my dad picked me up for the weekend. I, my, my dad annoys the shit out of me. So I'm just like, take me to Blockbuster. Let me go rent a movie, and I'll just watch a movie all weekend. Mm-hmm. And, like, when you were me- renting a movie for three, four days... To get your money's worth, you, you were... You watched that shit 20 times. Right! You were re-watching the shit out of these movies. So, like, parts two and parts three of The Matrix, I've seen, like, those, like, 15, t- 15 times a piece. Mm-hmm. But you haven't revisited. I have not. Like, mm-hmm. the last time I watched part three was when it came out, which was, like, Jesus Christ. Like, around with when the Animatrix here came out, which mm-hmm. was already, like, 18 years ago? Mm-hmm. How, how old am I? Why am I so old? Yeah, why is years going up <laughs> why, so why does time keep going by? So I must have been like 10, 11 years old mm-hmm. at the time. Uh, and, and we've seen things... I mean, we've talked about Ghost in a Shell before. We talked about how that story of Ghost in a Shell inspired telling the story of The Matrix. We've talked about different things that that we see in things now than things that we watch, like in Beastars, how they do like a... 3D camera around a, a fighting scene or something like that. Love it. Some shit that just blows your fucking brain. Mm-hmm. And it looks amazing. Mm-hmm. Every, by the time The Matrix came out, one of the luckiest shit is that everything had a green hue to it. Yep. And what's behind all the green hue? A green screen. You know right. what I'm saying? So it just makes sense. It looks great. I, I don't know what else I can say about The Matrix. But in The Animatrix, we start off with this nine tails that you said. The first two being uh, the sixth renaissance i believe it, it, it's called the second renaissance, oh, the Part, second parts, renaissance. parts one and two mm-hmm. which um it's it's these they're not my least favorite parts but they're also not my favorite parts and that's because like when we were watching the animatrix my favorite parts end up being the the sections that um are actually about the matrix you mm-hmm. know what i mean because these or sci-fi it's a post-utopian world it's the robots have taken over it's fucking um it's a uh, Terminator. It's, it's, it's Terminator. You know what I mean? Like I might as well be watching one of the shitty Terminator sequels at this point, mm-hmm. because when you're watching the matrix, the best one's the first one, because it's actually about the experience inside of the matrix, because the original storytelling comes from you being able to manipulate this computer generated world. Right. Mm-hmm. If you're woke enough. Right. That. Oh my God. <laughs> We, uh, I'll, I'll say it now. Like, um, <laughs> oh yeah, you told me I'll, you're I'll, aggravated about the pills concept. Like two, three months ago in the podcast, I talked about that. Uh, in a weekend, I had watched the QAnon doc- documentary that's on like Amazon or HBO, one of the two. And I hate, 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 hate that these fucking weird QAnon people have co-opted like the red pill fucking language for themselves. For themselves, <laughs> for stupid shit. It's like. Do vaccines actually prevent disease or is the government trying to track me over a network of, of secret bullshit? Which is dumb. Like, like that whole concept is stupid because it's like if a government was going to track somebody or kill them or poison them through a vaccine, why would they be doing that? 
to the individuals most likely to follow what the government's saying. Those are the people that they would protect, right? right. Yes. It, it'd be these dumbasses going against the government that they'd be more likely hurt, which still isn't fucking happening. Because... They're getting killed up by their own means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just <laughs> taking up all the hospital beds. It's, it's totally different. But um, to it to 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 say that that's your version of wokeness is so yeah dumb. Like you're there. I, I was watching. Um, I was. I don't even remember what it was. It might have been Twitter this morning. I was watching a video of somebody talking like, if I believe that COVID's real and that the hospital beds are being taken up by people that are critically ill in ICU beds because they have pneumonia brought on by COVID-19, the I'm watching people in the beds. I'm watching the moratorium. Uh, for work the other day, I had to compare the El Paso coroner's reports between 2019 and 2020 because... Um, uh, people in the office were w- wanted to see the difference in the two in the in the mor- moratoriums between both years. Mm-hmm. In 2020, there were literally twice as many reported deaths as in 2019. Mm-hmm. Most of them are attributed to COVID. If you are a somebody that's a COVID denier, I need to believe that the government, multiple government systems, there's a world government system that has come together. To create this elaborate conspiracy that is using multiple media outlets owned by different companies, different people in different countries to create the same narrative Mm -hmm. to trick a very select group of Americans, which like, so you're telling me that that's the smart thing, even though I have so much more to assume and so much more I have to believe Mm -hmm. with no context or no evidence. That's the opposite of convincing me. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it it sucks. It's a rabbit hole. It's it, and it's that's one of the fucking ideas in the Matrix on yeah. its own. You know what I'm saying? Which is so ironic. That's why yeah. I brought it up. It's like <laughs> ironic that the point of the Matrix is, is to is, follow that conspiracy. Is, is that you shouldn't be believing everyone else's bullshit. Yeah. But, but they've co-opted it away. That's like they're just. Oh, it's like a it's like a form of group self harm all mm-hmm. at the same time. It's so fucking weird. So to get away from that rabbit hole, and we jump into the Animatrix rabbit hole. Like you said, the first two episodes, uh, they were made by what studio? Did you say they were by? I I don't know the studio, but the director is Mr. Mahiro Maeda, mm-hmm. and he is a special individual because um he did design work for um. He he did the excuse me. He did design work for Neon Genesis Evangelion. He did the concept art most recently for uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Mm-hmm. Great movie, so, right? So his directing, his directing credits. Mm-hmm. This is this might be it, but he has a butt ton of mm-hmm. like concept art and design work for a bunch of different things that like are known for. Mm-hmm. Their 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 design layout, mm-hmm. and uh, you were saying that your the first two episodes are not your favorite, but you also didn't hate them. The only reason I believe that we do have this in common is that it expands on what the fuck really happened, right? It's, uh, in it, the conversations of the first Matrix, it's Matrix lore, yes, which is fine. Don't get me wrong, that's okay, but it's. The, that's not the fun part of the Matrix. It's, mm-hmm. it's Terminator shit. It's like mm-hmm. robots are taking over the world. We blacked out the sky. Mm-hmm. People are the, being mean to the to the Tesla bots. People are being mean to the Tesla bots. The Tesla bots grew a personality and they took over the world because people are a bunch of assholes. Like, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong. That all sounds correct so far. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, like, my... That that's not what I'm here for. I want to see cool inside the computer universe bullshit. Mm-hmm. I want to... Especially, like, in anime form... I want to see some shit that only the anime medium can tell me. Could tell you. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe we see some of this shit. Honestly, uh, the program. The program is the third story told in this hour and a half movie, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a Madhouse, right? Madhouse production. Studio, it it has um, directors that that are given credits in the Ninja Scroll film, which was also produced by Studio Madhouse. And Studio Madhouse is, like, one of the best animation studios ever. Like, it's Black Lagoon, Parasite the Maxim, okay, whatever. Uh, Season 1 of One Punch Man, which is, like, hands down one of the best, 
like examples of Jan- Japanese animation ever. Mm-hmm. Perfect Blue, Wicked City, like Perfect Blue is great. Madhouse is literally in like a top four, top five discussion of all anime studios ever. Mm-hmm. Like one of the best animated trailers I saw for this animation season, which is the fall 2021 anime season, mm-hmm. was for a co-production that they are doing with um, Amazon Prime. Is that the one that you wanted to watch? No, no, no. no. It, it's a co-production with um, what's that other one we like? That's doing everything. They did uh, that that the Eight shonen, one? the the shonen. They they did the shonen about the kid that's a spirit detective, but it's not Yu Yu Hakusho. Um, oh God. We we watched it. It's um, the guy ate a finger of a demon. Jujutsu uh, Jujutsu Kaisen. Jujutsu Kaisen. Yes. They're doing a um, a production that's coming out this season uh, that's a co-production with the studio that's making Jujutsu Kaisen and Attack on Titan season finale, which is about like a guy that's directing these magical anime girls with music because mm-hmm. he's a director. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm not entirely sure what it's about so far, but it's like... Like, Studio Madhouse is up there. That's the point. I'm not trying to go into that rabbit hole of what they're doing right now, but, like, people know Studio Madhouse. And they've done, for Animatrix, like, three of the episodes are done by Studio Madhouse. And those end up being, like, my favorite One episodes. The be- yeah, the best ones. And uh, this episode, it's, it's, it's really cool because you don't know... You don't know exactly where it's taking place. You don't know if it's in the Matrix. You don't know if it's in the real world, but... It, but it's called Tact Opt Destiny, uh-huh. uh, co-produced by Studio Mappa. Oh, Mappa. There you yeah, go. Yeah, we fucking forgot the name for Studio Mappa. And and this episode, it's a very... Almost like the first episode of fucking Visions in Star Wars Visions mm-hmm. is samurai crazy. The, the, the character designs are... Are great. We have this uh, like it looks female like character with big like mane, white hair, and it looks like Ninja Scroll. Yeah, it looks like Ninja Scroll, which is like a compliment Correct. in every way because Ninja Scroll is like super dope. It's a it's a film that came out in, like 1997, 1998 or something like that, which we've talked about talking about this for for the podcast before, mm-hmm. and we just haven't gotten around to it because there's so much bullshit to watch for this watch, fucking podcast. Yeah. But the, what's cool about the program is that it's so, so Japanese. Like, it's so Studio Madhouse. Like, you go from, like, these lore expansion, Matrix bullshit, like, feel sorry for the humans because they Fucked killed up. themselves <laughs> to the robots. And then you're going to, like, the actual cool shit, simulation. which is a simulation. It's an alternate reality. There's partitions moving from side to side. It's endless realities in every way. Mm-hmm. And the what's going on is it's this girl with this white mane. She's practicing inside of a program, learning how to like master her kung fu skills inside mm-hmm. of the Matrix, which we see in Horse the Matrix riding, one. Riding, yeah, spear handling. It looks great in the panels. That it's fast moving. It, she's on a horse. She's she's. She's drawing a bow with flaming arrows. It looks amazing. There's shadows everywhere. There's What's super dope is because even though this is like 17, 18 years old, what you see out of the Studio Madhouse produced episodes is this cool effect that they've kind of used to their benefit in every subsequent like anime production is they'll do 2D animation sequence, but they'll layer, they'll layer the animation over itself mm-hmm. with CGI. Mm-hmm. Which looks so crazy when you keep thinking, like, bro, this came out in 2003. When you see, like, sword fights and sword clashing and people in big-ass fucking, uh, like, samurai armor. Yeah. And it, it's it's great. It's great. It's great. Like, it, you would never assume this is even about the Matrix until you're actually trying to break down Have the dialogue. Some context like, on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, I was just trying to practice inside of the program. So I don't know if the an audience remembers, and I don't know if you remember, but the character Cypher in the first movie, in the first Matrix, he's the he's the he's the guy that betrays the entire group on the on the what's the ship's name? The Morpheus ship? Uh the Nanakinezer or something yeah, like that? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar or something like that. So Cypher makes a deal inside the Matrix with Agent Smith, and he's like, you know what? I'll give you the crew. I just want you to erase my memory. Put me back in the Matrix. I want to be rich. I want to do this. I want to do that. So this episode kind of follows like a a couple, a love interest couple, 
that are in the same simulation practicing. We are in in another ship. We're not in the in the Morpheus crew, but in there, the male uh, antagonist at this point he tells the girl is like, "Hey, uh, let's just fucking go back. Like we we can we can." We can forget all of this and and shit like that. And she's like, "What are you talking about? We know the truth already. We're never gonna forget this shit." It's like, "Nah, I have a way." And blah blah blah. So they're stuck in this simulation because he somehow blocked any any communications with the crew. Right. And now we see these two lovers in a way uh, going at it. What I think is super ironic that like that you opened up this episode talking about how um, the the. What are the names? The the Wachowski, Wachowski sisters mm-hmm. transitioned because originally they were brothers, which is fine. Like, I'm not fucking Dave Chappelle. Don't get me wrong. I don't see anything wrong with that. Like, uh-huh. anybody that listened to our last episode with Rachel and about Fruits Basket, my biggest gripe with something like that was about the trans writing, right? Mm-hmm. What I think is super ironic that you're talking about most of the Matrix is a metaphor for going into yourself and not being real for who you are and your agenda, your gender, your identity, whatever. The character in program, her name is Sis, mm-hmm. as in cisgender, which is denoting or relating to a person whose sense of personal identity and gender compounds with their birth sex, mm-hmm. which is not how the Wachowski sisters saw themselves. Correct. The guy, the villain in this, is Duo because he sees like the du- the well, duality. Is, yeah, like yeah. I, I have my own sense of person inside of myself, but I'll present in a different way. Mm-hmm. How like society wants you, and that's how the Wachowskis wanted to get away from. Mm-hmm. There's so many metaphors and layering in this, which is great. Almost every episode in the Animatrix is like that mm-hmm. because the the ending of the of this episode that we're describing. Is they get in a fight inside of the Matrix, inside of this program, inside of the simulation training. Duo comes at Sis and is like, hey, I made that deal that you're talking about. Come with me. She, in this super dramatic fighting sequence, like snaps off a piece of his like samurai sword, mm-hmm. stabs him in the neck with it. And it looks amazing. Looks crazy. I, I can't, I can't so put it into crazy. words that how crazy it looks. It, and I don't believe, like, it's it's... It, it, it's dumbfounding that this came out almost 20 years ago. Yeah, 2013, 20, uh, I mean... 2003? Yeah, 2003. And, but it it was all fake, which in and of itself is kind of a cop out, but then maybe there's some more metaphors in there because she, the the point of the test in this program was that Duo never existed and it was up to Sis to not lose herself inside of the Matrix simulation to come back out of it and win and realize that that is how she was getting evaluated on her Correct. It was about focus. It was about uh, staying, like, to not be almost greedy and ambitious that, okay, maybe I can go back to the Matrix and live a better life than what I'm living as a homeless person and outside of the Matrix, you know? Right. But when she, well, yeah, when she does wake up, the whoever, the crew. Yeah, they don't I, name any of the rest of this crew, but yeah. she's inside of a ship, comes out of the Matrix, she's linked out. Punches the main dude in the face being like, hey, good job on the test. It was all a test. Isn't that weird that we totally implanted these memories of a love interest? Mm. Beats the shit out of him. And, and like, I, I I love that Studio Madhouse is a real anime studio because it's hilarious. Because it's just like, I get this super serious fighting and action sequence in Shonen. And then it's like, hey, look, here's some 2D butt cheeks because fucking anime. Some and, spannies. Some panties, yeah. Yeah, some spannies. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, it, it's 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 funny the production design in something related to an American studio like that. It's just, it's just funny that I see these Japanese isms mm-hmm. in in something like The Matrix, and that goes into like a few. The, most of the episodes are either produced by Madhouse or a a studio that I'd never heard of before outside of this. It's like called Two Degrees Celsius or something like mm-hmm. that. They produced Kid Story. They produced um, Beyond. And I think a detective story, Mm -hmm. Studio 4 Degrees Celsius. 4 Degrees Celsius, yeah. And my least favorite episode in all of the Animatrix, by a long shot, by by a fucking mile, is a kid's story. It was a drag. It's terrible. This is not... We've seen nine stories in the the span of uh, an hour and 30 minutes. That that episode might have been an hour because it was so long, bro. It felt terrible. Like, if this was like a kid's graduation project, I'd be like, ugh. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I know. I know. We brought this up before. Uh, in Kill Bill, 
there is the there is the um the story of the Japanese uh, assassin mm-hmm. in the animated anime style. They they do a, an animated style to tell her backstory. In that, for a small burst of time, it's good. It looks cool. They had a better idea with to use shadows, to use fire, to use blood in there. But this, they went out in the daylight. They wanted to do fast sequences of motion. They yeah. wanted to do all this stuff. But it, they also it, didn't want to spend time on it. It looked terrible. Terrible. It, it looks like um, the fucking Take On Me music video, which you brought brought up while we were watching mm-hmm. it. It, it looks like just their excuse for not spending time on the character modeling of characters in motion was like, no, that, that it's an artifact. Like, look, see, it's colored pencils. Mm-hmm. Nothing has to be in focus and everything looks like a wobbly blob because we're... And you can make the argument that that it looks like that because he's in the Matrix and that's how shitty the Matrix looks to him. Uh-huh. You know, you can make that argument oh. because that's how the episode starts. Where the fuck did you come from in the last two <laughs> weeks that all of a sudden you think in metaphors? I don't know where the fuck this Aldo Mendes came from that all of a sudden you think in metaphors. Did you read a book in the last, no, like, month? No, bro. I'm when did, when did this happen? I, I'm just talking before you, before you're still my ideas. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> that's, that's my point. I didn't even think like that. Uh-huh. I was like, holy fuck. So the episode begins with this kid. It, you can't really tell how bad the animation is because he's in a room. It's dark lit. The only light in there is his computer screen. And he's talking to what we think is the same people that Neo talks in the Matrix in his computer. Mm-hmm. He's like, hey, Neo, wake up. Follow the white rabbit, whatever. But in this episode, <laughs> in this episode, he's talking to someone. I forgot it's a bunch of Alice in Wonderland yeah, references. Yeah. And in this episode, he starts off with like, "Why does reality? Why does why do my dreams seem more real than 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 me being alive? Why does reality hurt?" <laughs> yeah, and, and you can make the argument that that's why that whole thing looks shitty to him, right? You know, and and not only that, we, there's a there's a, the there's a point here that is not brought up until like the next episode i believe the world record episode Mm -hmm. that um not only can someone wake from the matrix by taking the red pill but through trauma through through exhaustion through through something else by breaking the limits of the matrix program you can like push yourself out of it correct and And this is essentially what happens to this kid Right, because like he, the agents find him. They're like, he knows the secret. Run. He gets a call from Neo during class, and he's just like, and Neo, which I thought was cool. That was my favorite part of this was that like Neo's actually part character. of the canon in this episode. Yeah. He's running away from agents. He gets shot on the roof, and he doesn't. He jumps before he gets shot. He he's he makes to, to get to away jump. from the agents. He jumps. He crawls up the roof from a uh, a storm drain. Before he gets shot from the agents that are on the roof, he jumps off. Before he hits the ground, he's pulled out of the Matrix, and the first person he sees is Neo. And Trinity. And they, Trinity. They don't say it's Trinity, but it's Trinity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that that's like my favorite part of the whole thing. Like, it adds to the canon that Neo, after awaking after Matrix 1, really Was is... saving other people. Right! Which is like such a minuscule amount of people, but like, what you learn from Matrix 3 was just like any... Any number of bodies pulled out of the Matrix a win. was a win. Like, it was so significant to have, like, 30 fucking people out of 8 billion. And I believe the dialogue, once this kid comes to his own, like, outside of the Matrix, it's like, oh, shit, Neil, I knew you were my Jesus. I knew you were going to save me. It's like, I didn't save you, dude. Like, you did it yourself. Which, like, both me and you are kind of a-religious. Like, we, we have different ways to describe that. Um, but it's so ironic that that is how like Jesus Christ would probably describe himself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, dude, like I, I, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm just trying to help people. Right. Mm-hmm. Which like from the beginning of the matrix, Neil was always the one, a metaphor for Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which is cool. It's you know cool. what I mean? I, I, that's the only part I like about it. Like the last 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I'm sorry. We're like, it seems like we're, we're uh like just blowing like uh racing through these fucking episodes, which that's a great segue because uh, the next episode is fucking world record. Uh-huh. But we're racing through these episodes because it just gives you just a little bit of canon, a little bit of world building. It gives you just a little bit, but it it is fun to see all these different art styles. In this mm. episode, not so much. Mm. But again, you can bring in you can bring in the argument that the reason it looks so shitty is because the episode 
literally started with him saying that this fucking quality sucks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This reality is too garbage. It can't be real. <laughs> yeah. Which is, like, again, kind of ironic that this is how people that want to use red pilling and the Matrix as an excuse to not accept how reality it really is. That's how they think about it. But, like, they take it in, like, a negative route. Mm-hmm. It's, oh, my God. I honestly I can't I can't believe the the Animatrix isn't taught in a fucking anti vaxxer class at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but um the the next episode is literally my favorite episode. It's my it's one of my favorite episodes. It, I, I believe the sam- the program was one of my favorites. I, I think yeah. you I think you responded better mm-hmm. to the program at mm-hmm. the time. But which is like it's close. You don't mm-hmm. get what I mean. Like they're both produced by Studio Madhouse. Mm-hmm. But World Record, the animation style is something that I responded immediately to one of my favorite anime movies called Redline, which I've described to you before, which mm-hmm. I just Googled while we were speaking, is produced by Studio Madhouse. Mm-hmm. So go to fucking figure why I like Redline so fucking much. Mm-hmm. And Redline, some context, when it came out at the time, it um it it has a little bit of those qualities that we talked about Kids Story, even though it's it's different anime studios about like um the 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 character modeling is kind of jaded and fluid. And that's kind of how world record seems because but the characters it makes them stand out more. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like the background is really well done and it's flourished. So then you get these bigger than life characters with these lines of motion that mm-hmm. kind of flow not 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 naturally, but that that's cool. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It makes them stand out more. And that was my favorite thing one of my favorite things about the production in Redline. Mm-hmm. And the thing about Redline, the movie, which came out in two thousand ten, only seven years after that, that made Studio Madhouse declare bankruptcy. Oh, shit. Uh-huh. It took them so long to produce it. They dumped so much money into Redline to produce the animation style that is in world record, but for an hour and 40 minutes, mm-hmm. that they went broke trying to fucking do that shit. Correct. Well, yeah, because this episode, these stories are maybe, what, 20 minutes each? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what we see, I mean, what we see in, in world record, it's like, it's like, it's what I think art one one will be because you're working with muscles. We're following a a, a uh, an Olympic speed, sprinter. Yeah, an, an Olympic sprinter. Might as well be usually on bold, but we're we're following like like muscle stretches, uh, strides as as he runs in this short. Like, like that's some Michelangelo shit. Mm, like absolutely. the studying the form of the human body. Mm-hmm, exactly. And what what's crazy about world record? It, so it looks so good and like the colors pop out and like the character outlines are so emboldened but it's literally just about this american sprinter just like denying everybody else so it starts off this we're getting um oh there's a term for this kind of uh storytelling where it's like it shows you the end at the beginning correct and then it gives you some context in the past and then it shows you another 10 seconds from the future that you saw in the beginning Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, like a, a sequence to that. So we're watching his final run, but cut. In between, we're seeing moments of the past. Right, of him leading up to his final run. Mm-hmm. So we're we're watching him at the starting line at the beginning. The gun goes off. Uh-huh. Takes off. Great fucking animation, by the way. Like him just prop- prepping himself to take off. It, it just looks fucking fantastic. It's dope. It's yeah. dope. It, it's like if somebody were to like animate like Serena Williams pregame. Like it's wild. It's so wild. You're like, this dude's an animal. And the, people have to run against this guy? Like what do you, what do you mean? That? Mm-hmm. It, it's like I get it's anime. So it's super exaggerated anyways. But he, he it could be... Uh, what's like the? It could be a JoJo. Yeah, oh, I fucking know. Yeah, it's yeah. like a Black American JoJo. Like, holy fuck! I'm not running against that. What are you talking about? That's Joseph Joestar. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so as as he preps to on the t- on the on the takeoff line on on the starting line, uh, we we jump into a uh, like a something of his past. So in his last race, he was tested and apparently he failed the dopamine test. Right. And, he he uh and he had broken a record. Right, in that race. He he ran a five point nine nine, which I'm sorry that I didn't Google what the world record for a sprint is, but a, a hundred meters in six seconds sounds fucking wild to me. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know about that one, but yeah. So it shows him breaking the record, but then immediately, like he's on the phone with like his dad or his agent or somebody, being like, "Hey, it says you tested positive for doping, which like is layman's terms for steroids, right? Mm-hmm. So you test positive for steroids, your T levels are high, whatever, whatever." Um, I'm, I'm sure you'll get back up from this. So that's why we're learning he's doing this final run. 
is to get back on the world stage for everyone like denying him thinking that he's a cheater which mm-hmm. like I'm not sure you'd ever be allowed to do this kind of run again if you ever tested positive for doping, Mm -hmm. which is like... Especially in an other Olympic event. Right, which is like the only thing I want to pick apart because it's like... Mm. mm, But whatever, whatever. Mm. I get some cool animation sequences out of it. And then you see his best friend, who's also his agent. And like, this is my favorite, like, character modeling in almost all of the Animatrix is how, like, the agent and the runner here look because it looks so tangible and they they pop out the screen it looks like you're watching um looks dirty looks gritty looks i don't know it it looks like you're watching squid game yeah 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 yeah. like it's just so it looks so malleable yeah like you want to grab it you know like it's a less realistic animation style that makes you feel something more tangible which is like I'm sure there's a fucking art class about that bullshit, too. Uh, absolutely. It, like, it's so out there that it's like, oh, shit, like, I want it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just for some context, uh, Eugene's Bold War record for the 100-meter dash, it's 9.58 seconds. Holy shit. So, <laughs> so we're talking about breaking the world record by, like, almost in half. Yeah, <laughs> dude. What the fuck? Holy fuck. That shit doesn't even make sense. Okay, cool. Movie stuff. Anime stuff. Cool. Whatever. Yeah. But, um, so... We're we're leading up to that. His best friend's like, dude, I, I'm, I'm you quitting. You can't do it, bro. You can't do it. Stop pushing yourself. You you push yourself enough. You're whatever. He's probably he, it, there was probably a lot of miscontext in there. But like, bro, you're you're you're, you're you need to be hydrated well enough. You you can't do that. It's like it's unhuman for you to do that. The language he used was like, dude, your muscles are literally going to burst if you try to run as hard as you did during the prelims. Because what they're starting to show is like he wrote he ran like a six point eleven mm. during the prelim, which still breaks the world record for the hundred meter by like three seconds. Mm. But in this, like that's still under his doped world record. Mm. So he's like, nah, dude, that it, that doesn't even matter. Mm-hmm. Like I'm gonna I, show them. I'm breaking my my doped world record. Which was eight something. Right. Well, no, it was five point nine nine. Oh, okay. So he's trying to break five point nine nine. And um the next little bit we see is... Uh, him back in the track. Right. It's back him on the track. But, like, the motion sequence they're using, like, they're not, ama- they're not afraid to make it look ugly, which makes it look more human because he's straining in the face. <laughs> right. His, his the, the malleability of his cheeks are moving side to side. Mm-hmm. You see, like, individual... Um, quad muscles moving so he activates Muscle his fibers. knee right he's activating his knee first and then it goes up and he's activating his calves as his leg strides which is just like holy and, they spent time on this and as he's doing that they're still animate his lips as he's breathing so he's like spitting out some shit you know he's kind of just th- sprinting he's he's striding through this and a little bit of the behind story that is going on here in the podiums, in the in the boxes, if you will, there is agents who mm. are with matrix uh, matrix agents, not matrix sports agents. agents. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's agents talking to each other. It's like we can't allow him to wake up. Right. You know. So so then we go from that, and then we're cut right back to like this reporter, mm-hmm. which like one of my favorite character models in this whole thing. Even uh, it, it's pink anime girl with tits. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I reported, it's cool. and she's a reporter, yeah. and she's like, "Hey, super strong runner anime man. Like, mm-hmm. aren't you gonna do great tomorrow?" And the character design difference is hilarious because. Our, our our sprinter is like he's like seven feet tall, <laughs> yeah. and this little itty bitty tiny reporter is like, hey, what's up? What are you doing? Hey, what's up? Hey, yeah. I'm gonna follow you to the elevator. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's just it, and it's so like anime edgy Badass. too. Yeah, yeah he's it's just, just walking. He doesn't even stop for her. She he's, she's already like, oh, you already broke that record during the prelim trial. Why are you even trying? So he's like, don't worry about it, bitch. I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> like because he he's. Determined. It, it, he's not doing it for anybody other than himself, which yeah. is one of my... It's such, like, a generic, like, anime writing trope, but, like, I fall for Ugh. it every Give time. It you know what I mean? Yeah. I fall for it every <laughs> time. And, and so we, we get into one of the last uh, present Flash sequences where he's running, and me and you had to watch it, like, two times when it happens because, like, his right leg bends down, hits the pavement... And strides forward. Strides and- yeah, and and, it's, and you can see the animation. You can see the 
the curvature of the of the muscle fiber is ripping inside of you. So like there's a rippling coming out of like the knee from like the quad up oh. where where you just see like he tore a tendon. He 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 ruptured the part of his quad that is connected to his knee uh-huh. and which slows him that it slows him down a little bit. Right. So <laughs> all this whole sequence is happening in the span of six seconds, we're led to believe. And the agents on the bleachers are like, oh, don't worry about it. He, he, he's not going to break the record. He's not going to break out of the Matrix. He's all right. We, we just sabotaged him sort of. Yeah. Because it's seen as like artificial ways of stopping him because it's like there's like this black clouding that comes out of when he tears the muscle ligature. Correct. That's like there's some manipulation, manipulation. happening in yeah. the Matrix around his body. So what you're describing, there's like that quarter second of like hesitation where he's like, holy shit, I just tore my fucking quad. And mm. he just gets the, gets the fuck back up. even faster. And sprints he, even faster. Because he doesn't fall. He just kind of like ugh, stumbles a little bit like nothing. Like his fucking leg didn't just explode it. And he's like, no. It, without him knowing like the outside manipulations of, of the Matrix, he doesn't know he's in the Matrix. He's... He's just a guy that wants to prove himself. Just like a real athlete. like He was just in the moment. And he's just striding now back again, getting in the front of the fucking race again. And now the fucking agents are fucking like losing they're it. They're freaking yeah, out. They're freaking out. So uh, if you guys know the Matrix, when a, an agent manipulates a quote-unquote NPC of the Matrix... Like they could just turn into them, right? That that is a Dungeons and Dragons originating term that stands for non playable character, right? So so you're right. So like the people around him are NPCs; they're not real people because this is the Matrix. This is a fucking video game. It's a simulation, and they're just there to as distractions them. for for our runner character here. So the agents who are the programs meant to regulate the inner workings of the Matrix, take over those NPCs, have slowed down time, and are now trying to catch our protagonist in the act of beating the world record. Because he's running so fast. They can't catch him. They can manipulate speed. They can be faster than him. But him breaking the own barriers of the Matrix is faster than them. Right. They're also like working the, the, the time flow of the Matrix against him, trying to hold him back, trying to slow the track around him so that he doesn't break the record. But he's so fast and his will is so strong that he breaks through all that manipulation, the bounds of this computer simulation Matrix, and like he wakes up for half a second. And, and we, we go back to the pods, like Neo in the first Matrix, when he's in those red pods. He literally wakes up. So, so some of the context that we didn't even describe in uh, the second Renaissance is that the point of the Matrix is that it's a computer simulation held by these world-controlling robot AIs that have put humanity inside of pods to distract their consciousness inside of the Matrix so that they can harvest our electrical impulse energy to patter to, to power to, up their own machines because right. the humans in the in the first episodes the renaissance part two they block out the sun right because the robots are solar or something i don't yeah. fucking know yeah exactly so him for because the because the agents in the matrix already knew the matrix the, the agents in the matrix told the outside machines that this particular pod might be in in, in in danger to wake up so when he wakes up when he's about to cross that finish line he wakes up in the pod he's screaming the machines are already there they fucking they they, they put uh you know uh, what do you call it like like a, harnesses like harnesses on him they fucking shock him into like going to sleep again he literally woke up from the matrix out of sheer will and mm. this is like super berserky to me Crazy. You know what I'm saying? Crazy. Because he's like, ah, oh, and he's just getting electrocuted, and boom, he gets put back in the race, finishes the race, and just... As- he, he ran like a 5.74. Die. Like, he, <laughs> so you're telling me, this fool ruptured his quad, and still ran a 5.74. That's like the... Which is so cool. Like, it's it so cool. dope. Like, I'm watching it. I was just like, that's the wildest thing I've ever heard of in my life. That you could literally break a world record in the middle of tearing your quad. Which, like, I do want to pick a, pick apart some biochemistry here. So, some chemistry physics. That, like, it's it's not a big gripe right? because it's a movie. It's a it's a fictional world, right? Mm-hmm. So it doesn't really matter. But um, especially, like, in the 90s and early 2000s, there was a misunderstanding 
about the electrical impulses in people's brains and what that actually meant or once that, what that's coming from. Electricity is just the the transfer of electrons from one piece of matter to another, mm-hmm. right? Super simple. Which is why, like, you get, for batteries, you get uh, metals with high deviations in, like, electron concentrations. Mm-hmm. You get lithium and stuff like that, which can vary in their amount of electrons by a great amount. That's mm-hmm. literally just the flow of electrons. For the, the human body's electrical impulses are so minuscule that something like the Matrix could never happen. Even if you were to get, like, all 8 billion people in the world, you could never... Or you might create a spark. Maybe, maybe. Maybe. But that small electric impulse that comes from, like, your brain chemistry is actually from the actual chemistry signaling that's happening in your brain. Because it's, like, different salt concentrations. It's different metal concentrations. It's the transfer of electrons through chemical interactions mm. that accounts for that small amount of spark that, like, people at once thought was enough to, like power a robot civilization so like it's not a big gripe it's a movie it's anime don't mm-hmm. get me wrong but like the the actual physics there is just wrong mm-hmm. and it, it it reminds me of um like how um what, what am i thinking of the what are the dinosaur movies called jurassic park the, oh, yeah. the jurassic park jurassic world movies like the the jurassic world movies especially the recent ones there have been enough like um uh studies done and enough like fossils and like all this other information that we have since the original Jurassic Park came out that shows that those dinosaur character models are not how dinosaurs looked like at all. They were covered in feathers and had different colors. Mm -hmm. They don't look like just lizards, but big, (laughs) which is, it's, uh, it's fine. It's a movie, but what, what pisses me off about stuff like that is that people have this tendency to believe movies as fact, Mm -hmm. like how anti-vaxxers think the Matrix is real. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, so now people have this no real sense of your brain chemistry, have no sense of what dinosaurs look like, have no sense of like what is real and what is fake, which Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I, I get it's entertainment, but like we're starting to see that a certain segment of the population is not smart enough to realize what's entertainment and what's reality. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, that was that was world record. World record is yeah, like you said, one of our favorite ones. Well, well the ending. I just want to pick it apart. Oh, oh shit, that's right. Because it's so out. dope. So like he he comes out, comes back in. Him putting back into the matrix. The agents are now like focused on him because they know he has the potential to bust out of the matrix. But what they're starting to show is he tore both of his legs during the fucking race while while breaking the world record. And you see the agent in the background being like, yeah, we'll keep an eye on him, but like he'll never be able to walk again even. Like he's never going to break those bounds of the matrix ever again. Mm. And then for a second, just through sheer willpower, he's trying to recapture that moment where he broke out of the matrix and he's in a wheelchair. He stands up and you think he's going to start busting out of there again. Running, yeah, yeah. Running. And like even the agent in the background watching this happen, he's like, holy fuck, it's really going to happen. And and then he just collapses on the ground, which is like – the that's like my favorite story out of like all this animatrix stuff because it, it's so like it encapsulates a whole story within itself because he wasn't even supposed to be able to get up right you know what i'm saying and and the and the dialogue between the agents are like sit down stay in your seat don't do it and him it's almost inner dialogue but i don't know how much dialogue we heard but you can see in the animations you can see that he's like fuck like this is not real like i i, I know this is not real and and he gets up and he busts us through his braces through his because because you see you hear from the agent too that he's like yeah we have made he erases we erased his memory about like him busting out and like his whole world record and the whole incident whatever whatever it's okay it's it's handled which like it clearly wasn't like mm-hmm. a certain part of like muscle memory remembered like what it felt like to bust out of the matrix mm-hmm. and that goes into one of the more boring episodes to me. Which, it's it's still, like, it's called Beyond. Mm. It's about a girl trying to find her cat, which is another one of those Studio 4 Degrees Celsius productions, which is, like, what I will give Studio uh, 4C uh, credit for is the character modeling in this. Mm. The main character has, like, peach pink hair with, like, a blue undertone. A star on her face. It looks like a character out of Space Dandy or something like that. It reminds me of uh, FLCL. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. And, and like we we don't have any of these weird, um, 
artsy penciling. interpretations. There's no penciling that we've seen in other episodes. Like, I was excited at first. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it looked good. But the actual, like, <laughs> we've talked about this in um, in anime before where it's studios like to jerk themselves off. And, like, they, they get so hyper-obsessed in their own production and their own quality that they forget that they're storytelling at the same time. Mm-hmm. Which is how Beyond feels. Because it's about a girl trying to find her cat. So she finds an abandoned warehouse that kids are playing at that is a pocket dimension of glitches in the Matrix. Mm -hmm. So the kids are able to break glass bottles and reshape them and toss them to each other. Mm -hmm. You can uh, jump mid-air and slow down time enough that you can do a somersault and flip back down. And it seems like a bug in the Matrix. Right. And I feel like this episode, if, 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 if anything... What he was trying to convey is sadness because, uh, you, yeah, you you talked about the plot. And the plot is such a, like, big X, little X kind of storytelling mm-hmm. when we think that the big X is finding the cat. But, I mean, the little X is finding the cat. The big X is that they found this glitch inside the, the Matrix. Right. And, uh, but what... As I as I'm being bored, as I'm, I'm as I'm losing interest it's in this episode, it just takes too much time to show you that in 2D they can animate Matrix action sequences, mm-hmm. and not even it's not an action sequence. It's like look at me do a flip, but I'm gonna slow down time mid air. Mm-hmm. It's that's cool, that's neat. I watched the original Matrix. Mm-hmm. Why do I have to see that for an extra ten minutes? And and what I mean about like this episode being sad is that she was literally at the exit door to the Matrix, right? And and because of this whole like you know the agents working and manipulating stuff, so we have authorities like she's like, also in Japan. She's also in Japan, which is really cool. You said the the, the it, it looks to me like FLCL, right? But without action, right? But to me, like this episode, especially in comparison to to uh the kids the kid the beyond or, or or to the world record right this girl was so close to break out and she didn't get the chance to right so like the she finds her cat in this abandoned warehouse where kids are hanging out and they've learned that they can manipulate the matrix and they're just doing dumbass kid shit right her as an adult she's learning how to do flips and how to do actual cool like superhero shit and the kids start following her doing it and we think we're going to get a moment of somebody speaking to her through a closed door in this abandoned warehouse at the same time that a bunch of agents and, like, cleaners, air quotes, cleaners, are, like, coming through to fix this broken pocket dimension mm-hmm. that you think that she's going to break out of it. But the opposite story as as uh, world record is that her willpower, her motivation, her curiosity didn't, didn't take her over to the point of that, crossing that doorway. Of crossing that doorway, which we saw, like there was a piece of dialogue in um, in program where they were uh, when they were doing the samurai fight, where Duo was telling Sis, like, yes, I took the re- the red pill because I was curious because I wanted to know the truth, but now I'm done knowing the truth. Like, I don't want to know anymore. It hurts. Which, which like, <laughs> as a joke, I'm like, yeah, reality is pain. Yeah, yeah. I feel like fucking Mr. Meeseeks out here. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, so I get it, but we never get, like, that fulfillment there. It feels like, uh, like a scene out of Akira where, like, the cleaners and the government agencies come through. Got the work done. Got the work done, clean up, and that's it. Like, I didn't learn anything from this bit. Mm-hmm. This girl goes about her normal life like nothing happened. Mm-hmm. Which, like, she had such a cool character model and character design that, like, they spent more time in this episode showing you that they can animate things in slow motion mm-hmm. than actual telling a story. Mm-hmm. And she's not a she's not a special character. She wasn't doing anything. She wasn't breaking world. 100 meter dash records but but she reminded me of like that meme about anime where it's like they'll show you a still in any like shonen where it's like point out the main character and it's fucking yugi moto with like red and gold and pointed black hair being like well it's obviously that nerd Mm -hmm. that's how she looks like i expected big things from her i'm like with that character model i expect her to be the next fucking neo i don't Mm -hmm. know but it, it just it didn't happen and it's it's boring it is it is and again I'm just gonna give you the benefit of the doubt that they wanted to give you some some parallels, not parallels, but like um, different different outcomes of of the people that are trapped in the matrix. I, I understand, and mm-hmm. I don't know how much like the Warner Brothers studio was telling 
each studio because we're comparing a Madhouse production to a Studio 4C production. I don't know how much the the actual like Warner Brothers studio is telling you like, no, you can't do that story again because Madhouse already did it. Mm-hmm. But uh, if I'm comparing it to the 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 Star Wars Visions comparison, it Star Wars Visions really feels like. Disney was just like, hey, we're going to give you the super rare, like, opportunity to use one of our IPs to do whatever the fuck you want. A little slack on the leash. Right. We're going to give you as much, like, slack on the leash as you're talking about as possible. Tell whatever story you want. Just just make sure it looks good and it feels good, which is, like, how every episode of Star Wars Visions feels. This, this this doesn't feel that good. This doesn't this doesn't feel nice. It feels like an empty fifteen minutes that I want back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely it does. And uh, to that uh, brings us to what is the next one on the a here? detective story, which I did Ooh, not mind. Which, I like that one. It, it which is another Studio Four C production. It's the best Studio Four C episode in the Animatrix for me. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Uh, the the gray the grainy scale, uh, black and white. Obviously, to make it look noir. And noir, noir, and steampunky. Mm-hmm. Uh, the 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 granulated uh, great scale. It looks amazing. It, <laughs> it looks good. Which, which like, uh, not to spoil too much of next week's episode, but you, what you were describing, episode one of of Star Wars Visions, has like this grainy texture that I don't like because in Star Wars Visions, episode one has a CG modeling with like this answer instagram filter looking grainy penciled filter over it uh-huh. this one feels like well maybe it's just because it's 2d and it's hella biased to cgi i don't know i don't know i have mm-hmm. problems with cgi but in a detective story it's what you're describing like it feels like uh the the spider-man character where he's actually a spy it feels like batman noirs it mm-hmm. feels like feels like a comic book it mm-hmm. feels like a noir comic book which is so dope like mm-hmm. it's so gritty and it stars like any noir should start like it starts off with like the pi's detective door and and with light coming through it and and him being all pensive and and and, and he has a conversation with his cat that's a great word i love that word pensive yeah yeah and 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 he even the the he, he's having this inner dialogue. He's like, "My account is empty. My 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 motivation Same. is empty." Same. <laughs> uh, and then the phone rings, and he talks to his cat. He's like, "Hey, if this is another suspicious husband, I'm, we're out of this game." Yep. You know, he picks. And by the way, here we we're we're in the office of the detective, and he has some badass like steampunky noir like high tech which you would never see in a noir which, which like talking about the like the loose slack storytelling that we were talking about with Star Wars Visions this is the only one that feels like that out of like the Studio 4C productions for Animatrix because it's like the anim- like the Matrix is supposed to be a parallel to what actual 21st century human society would look like mm-hmm. but you're right like everything looks steampunky like he gets the call and he's like, "Look at your account." And he like on like an old school looking nineteen fifties typewriter types in "Look in account" and out pump, out comes like some Bioshock looking film bulb eight hundred thousand number, mm-hmm. which is cool. Why are why weren't we doing this already? Like, yeah. I didn't know that we could fudge like what reality storytelling in the Matrix looked like because I thought it was supposed to look like real society. But they they think that's what reality is. So who cares? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is like that's dope. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like we couldn't have built on this like plot sooner. Like that's great. Mm-hmm. Almost every episode should have been like this. Mm-hmm. And you're you're right. It's just a call of somebody being like, "Hey, find the hacker Trinity." And figure out who the fuck he is. And to fans or people that know The Matrix is like, oh, shit. Not even fans. Like, anybody that saw the blockbuster <laughs> film The Matrix in 1999 knows who Trinity is. They're looking for Trinity. Holy shit. Yeah. It's great. It's, oh. it's a great hook for the episode. Already a great looking episode. Right. And, uh, yeah, the agents, like, go find this hacker. It's like, uh, well, who am I working for? Oh, you're, you're not in the need to know basis. It's like, well, fuck you. It's like, well, check your account. Oh, fuck. $800,000. I'll do whatever you say. <laughs> yeah. And we go into this little montage of what a PI would look. And I, one of the greatest shots is that he forgets his hat. Yeah. And his cat just fucking swings that fucking hat at him. I love it. I, I, I love it because it's like, it's anime at the end of the day, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's just like, hey, cat, you forgot your fucking hat. Uh, giant 
twenty pound chubby cat on this uh, firewall stairwell just like throws mm-hmm. a a nineteen fifties looking PI top hat at the guy, mm-hmm. and, and it's dope. It's it's great. Like he's doing PI work. But one of the the best sequences for me are is again we go back in this futuristic slash steampunky slash old nineteen fifties looking computer where he figures out that he needs to start talking to the red queen air quotes red queen in alice in wonderland terms to figure out where trinity is so him on like an i am like an uh like an msn messenger chat room chat room board as the name the white knight or the white pawn the white pawn the white pawn is messaging the red queen being like hey I'm at the edge of the looking glass. Where's Trinity? I know she's on the other side of the looking glass. Right. Uh-huh. Because he doesn't know what he's talking about. Correct. But he's learned the language from his PI work. Correct. Which, again, Alice in Wonderland terms from the original Matrix. It's about coming out of that rabbit hole. Which, Alice in Wonderland was all metaphors for acid trips. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, like, we're, we're talking metaphors on metaphors on metaphors here. Mm. We're, we're talking... Like like Inception. <laughs> yeah, we're talking 70 years of interpretations of one dude's acid trips. <laughs> we're talking about an interpretation of interpretation of interpretation about a dude that took acid in 1935. And then what does the Red Queen reply on the chat? No, you are the one on the other side of the looking glass. Another fucking interpretation to so another acid trip. And you're like, oh, okay, fuck it. Fuck it. I love it. <laughs> cool. Whatever. Yeah. You can tell me whatever you want at this point. And she is like, okay, I'll talk to you. Uh... Meet me at the sixth brook. At the sixth brook of whatever. I, I think she just said the sixth brook. Yeah. The Red Queen was like, "Meet me at the sixth brook at twenty fifty hours, whatever." So mm-hmm. military time, eight fifty p.m. Okay. Uh, and he waited until fucking nine p.m. to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> like, like it's like seven forty-five, and he's like, "Holy shit, I can be there at 8. Uh, and I, even I was like, "What the fuck does six brook mean?" So again. More Alice in Wonderland imagery here. It's like the first brook was was Alice crossing over into the into the rabbit hole. The second brook, and, and I don't know. There's a very quick explanation. It felt smart at the time. Yeah, maybe I just fell into the storytelling. It, it was 20 minutes of fucking story time, so it just goes fast, and you're like, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can tell me some. It's it's like when like medical movies or medical shows just say some quick bullshit, and you're like, whatever, yeah. sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> His fibulus is inside of his tibulus. We have to perform surgery immediately. Yeah. Awesome. Let's go. You mean twi- 20 cc's of whatever. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. 20 cc's of I have a metron stat. Okay, cool. <laughs> right. That sounds like that's going to do something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so like he figures out that it means that he needs to get on the subway train and he's like late, like we we're describing. And he jumps on this exact train. Almost like the White Rabbit was late in Alice in the Wonderland. Like the White Rabbit was late in Alice in Wonderland. He gets in the train, gets in the exact cab car that he knew that she was going to be at, pulls out his gun, which is just like this itty bitty little six shooter. Which is cool because it's totally a PI kind of gun, like in the 1950s. Yeah. So it goes with the theme, even though like everybody around him is totally like 1999. Even though the female character that he bumps into has like this super space gun. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he, pu- he pulls into the cab car a la like episode three of harry potter it like points his gun at her and it's trinity which is dope because like the character design is great right here when i was like eight nine years old i remember just seeing like you tall top, tall top, la- tall lady in, in spandex, spandex yeah in mm. spandex and leather I, I didn't know what that meant at the time but i was like this, this there was things building in you there I, was i responded positively <laughs> at the time right absolutely, absolutely. so seeing that character modeling right here i was like Yes, that used to give me an erection in 1999. I responded possibly to that maybe seven times if I can remember. <laughs> so, so I see young Trinity in the in the in the leather costume, and I'm just like, "Holy shit, it's Trinity!" And she's hot again. <laughs> and, and, and she points the space gun at his eye because most trusting PI in the world, right? She's just like, "Hey, don't shoot me! I'm gonna stick this fucking space gun in your eye, and I'm gonna pull something out." Trust me. Mm. He's like, "Okay, just do it." Yeah, because like I, I believe the dialogue was like, "Had any had any eye exams dreams lately?" And like he's like, "Oh shit, yes, I have." 
So he does pretty much, like, if you've seen the first Matrix, uh, when the agents intercept uh, Neo, they put this fucking, like, worm in his tummy, and that's what they suck out in, like, the one part, in the one car, in the one raining It's like part. a tracker or a yeah. virus or... It's, it's a, a it's tracker. A, it's a tracker. It's a metaphor for a bunch of different things because we're supposed to be inside of a computer program, right? So it's like a virus, a tracker. It's, it's a fucking phishing a scam. Yeah. <laughs> so... Through the 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 space gun he she puts on her eyeball, she pulls out the tracker robot thing. And that like unleashes like his interpretation of reality because again it's like that looking through the hourglass thing, it's that red pilling thing. He's he was being lied to and had this lying bug giving him a false interpretation of reality. But once Trinity takes it out, he realizes that the other passengers on the train were agents mm -hmm. the whole time. So Trinity and him immediately have to do a full on like gun shootout with agents, which like even in the Matrix movies, like it barely matters when you shoot an agent. Like yeah. it slows them down kind of. Yeah, because they can just transfer their program or whatever to another NPC. Right, right. So it barely even matters. So this whole train was just a ploy to get, get Trinity. Yeah, to get Trinity because the PIs hired him to figure out where the fuck Trinity was hiding. Mm -hmm. and But she's smart enough to know that it was bait the whole time. So they're running. You think that it's going to be another one of the uh, like one of the earlier episodes where they're getting people out of the Matrix, a la Kid's story. And you think this time it's, it's Trinity's turn to pull somebody out of the Matrix, right? Mm -hmm. But it turns out that um, he was already like indoctrinated by the agents. Mm -hmm. And he was almost taken over by like an agent, a la like uh, Agent Smith used to take over not non NPC characters in Matrix mm -hmm. Two and Three, Correct. where he would just get actual people overtake their character model inside of the Matrix, overtake their personality, and like become an agent. Mm -hmm. And that almost happened to the the PI in this scenario in front of Trinity, and she shot him. Shot him. She was just like, "I'm sorry, dude, you almost made it, but like you didn't," and just shot him in the stomach. And that like shocked him out of transferring into an agent, uh -huh. but at the same thing, like he understood. Yeah, he, he's like he wasn't even mad. He was just like, "Yeah, I was totally about to fucking murder you." Yeah. So she busts out of the the cabin, but the coolest sequence here is at the beginning. We saw our PI character laid back and tired inside of like a like a train seat, like Mugen train, but it looked like a it looked like something out of Cowboy Bebop almost. Mm -hmm. where um you could almost expect uh spike to be like laid back in the train and be like hey mr agent and shoot him in the face or something which that's how this ends which is like super noir in and of itself absolutely because he, he even says as he's lighting his hair the the job to end all jobs you know and and the, it ends. And he kills these two agents, uh -huh. like to protect Trinity as she escaped from the train. Yeah, and and I and now that I think about it, it might be just something to tell you that how much they needed Neo, because you obviously are seeing Trinity fail at saving some of these people out of the Matrix. Right. Where you know Neo is just like, ah, they just show up. He's Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He can accomplish anything. Yeah, because well, Trinity is still like the Trinity, like the Holy Trinity. You yep. know what I'm saying? So it's all yep. just it was all Jesus metaphors. <laughs> it was all metaphors for coming out of his trans. It was yeah. all this stuff, which is great. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm super. I'll probably watch the ne the next Matrix movie opening weekend. Like I want to watch. I, it. I, I don't give a shit. And uh, second to last story here, we do have a a really cool one called. Uh, matriculated it was uh, it was something else matriculated had as soon as i saw it was one of my favorite character models was the 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 female protagonist in matriculated because it's it's again super 90s so i don't know what we were on in the 90s that all characters had to be tall and lanky uh -huh. which like it looks like a uh, code geass lelouch of the rebellion yeah. like all these characters but just, with nice butts <laughs> yeah so because <laughs> because we're watching fucking matrix hentai uh she's just in like panties and bras the whole time which is cool <laughs> all right i'll watch that but um what's interesting here is that the other studios and directors were all japanese this one is directed by mr peter chung who is korean which like i just watched squid game all of mm -hmm. last weekend fucking love everything that mm -hmm. korean media is doing mm -hmm. right now and um, it's 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 really the 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 animation style for the rest of this episode is 
not so much steampunky that we're getting away from, but it looks um really sci-fi-y. But it doesn't look like it's copying the Terminator, mm. which I complained about in different episodes of Animatrix, but it looks like... um It's funny that you say that, because to me it reminded me just of like Judgment Day, Terminator days. Okay, you're right. So yeah. I guess when I'm talking about the Terminator, I'm thinking about like some of the older Terminator movies where it, it feels like Hollywood had like this really closed in idea of what like futuristic productions could look like mm-hmm. and that's why the matrix and terminator kind of look the same mm-hmm. these newer productions are a lot of greens a lot of blues it looks like mass effect 3 in fucking anime form mm-hmm. which is great mass effect 2 is like my favorite game of all time mm-hmm. and this one is done by miss by dna productions which is headquarters in dallas texas which is is different from things that we've been seeing, even though like it's clear that DNA Productions was trying to copy the Japanese animation style. Mm-hmm. And if you've seen uh, Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius, <laughs> yeah, which is wild, which is so wild, because DNA Productions literally made the film Jimmy Neutron Bo- Boy Genius and co-produced the show that later p- came out on Nickelodeon. Okay. So you're like, how the fuck is this studio I've never heard about able to produce this? And it's like, oh, okay, they 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 they're, they're good at this. They're, mm. they're they're used to this already, because this came out two three years after Jimmy Neutron came out. Mm. And the the story here, the the actual production here is it's it's it wants to trip you out. It feels like a DMT trip, fucking Joe Rogan episode, fucking it's just crazy and all and all. I, I don't know. Okay, so the main idea for this is that so we have we have our protagonist, the 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 character design that you so much liked, mm-hmm. and and she's in a field in a in a dark. I don't even think they named her. No, they don't. They don't name a lot of characters yeah, here. Yeah, they don't and, name and, and I want to and I want to apologize to the audience, but yeah, a lot of these stories are just like quick. Oh, paced. oh, before before I lose that thing about uh, Peter Chung uh-huh. from Korea, he created Aeon Flux. Oh, okay. So nice. like it's so, Aeon Flux. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. it's Aeon Flux, but Matrix. Yeah. <laughs> so. And uh, so we follow her. She gets intercepted by two walkers, which are uh, some some sort of drone drones, robots. robots from the future. And she's running away. She's outside of the Matrix. She's outside of the Matrix. Yeah, we're in dystopian landfill or whatever. Right. And uh, she's getting she's getting uh, uh, tracked by these robots into where she ambushes them to uh, by getting them in this room t- with another robot that they have. That they have successfully um, uh, jailbroke into helping them. Right. So uh, it's clear that Miss Aeon Flux, or whatever the fuck her name is, is she's part of a group of people that have been capturing Sentinel robots and like testing them because they're putting them into the Matrix and like giving them false realities and they're trying to convert these robots to help them in their fight against the the evil robots. Mm -hmm. So this first animation sequence is great. It's like five whole minutes of her like jumping around garbage and like just uh, Terminator style just getting away from these robots that are walkers which like they look like Daddy long leg, like not spider, but bug Rain things. Mantis looking like right, shit, like yeah. long legs, like long individual pointy limbs. It's eerie. Yeah, and you think that she's gonna like die, but her whole plan was to get them inside of her base to capture an android. Right, to capture an android. I mean, an p- android robot. Robot yeah. to plug its brain into the matrix. And one of them was able to see her trickery because most of them are just mindless droids. They're mindless robots, right? Mm -hmm. Which, like, when you compare every episode of Star Wars Visions, almost every episode with a uh, a Jedi trainee reiterates the point that Jedi, with their attunement to the Force, can interpret the will and motivations of droids, Mm -hmm. of robots, which is, like... All life is life at a certain point, which is mm-hmm. what this is trying to teach you right here. Because one of the robots doesn't immediately fall for her tricks or her gambits or whatever. And it, she has to put a little bit of extra effort to like trick it and to get it into her base. And she points out to the rest of her crew. She's like, hey, this one's smarter than the rest of the ones that we've been tricking. We need to put him in the Matrix immediately. Mm-hmm. So we get some exposition from a scientist character, which like looks like the dad from Invader Sim. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> who who is like another mad scientist kind of character where uh he's describing 
a lot of like the logic to the matrix and how people viewed androids and AI. Because if you're a hundred years removed from the fall of society and robots taking over, you you're not e- it's not even animosity anymore. This is the reality mm-hmm. of the situation. And the uh, the Aeon Flux character here again is trying to be like, hey, isn't it kind of immoral to be putting a false reality into an AI? Well, that is what they did to you. Right. He's like, that's exactly what they did to us. That's exactly what the Matrix is. Number one. Number two, for an AI, for an artificial intelligence, they are literally interpreting reality. Any other reality that I'm putting into it, he might as well assume that's an interpretation of that reality. Which is like a metaphor of a metaphor of a metaphor inside of storytelling. It's like, where holy, am I? Yeah. yeah, holy fuck, where am I? Like, if I'm just... A, am I real? A, if I'm just a mass of proteins and enzymes just functioning together, like, I'm just interpreting the signals around me. How do I know what reality is? And like, in, in like a 10 second window, this episode's telling the audience that. And, and it's up to you to be like... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. How much do you want to interpret yeah, yeah. from this? Because it moves on quickly. It's yeah. just like, okay, whatever. It, because the, the, the main um, DMT trip of it all is that this group of like 16 members, including like a, an eye eye, a monkey, uh, a South American giant eye lemur looking thing, mm-hmm. plug themselves into a kind of like the, the program episode mm-hmm. where it's a pocket dimension, a pre-programmed dimension of the matrix where they're going to show this ai an interpretation uh it, it, they're going to break him out of the matrix they're going to break him out of the programming robot, that it, he has yeah the programming ai mold that he's accustomed to and it does this of just like a bunch of colors and people, geometry and people fucking in ai world and, and and people taunting this 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 robot with their sexy nude Cyber bodies and right. spiritual bodies. They, and- they try really hard to animate her butt cheeks inside of this Matrix world, mm-hmm. which, which is like fine, thank you. But <laughs> and, and and to me, it just reminds me of the of the title uh, Ghost in a Shell, right? Because right now we're seeing this fucking robot tripping balls with this fucking people that don't give a fuck that this guy's tripping balls because that's the fucking whole point of it, right? And it's almost like like your ego breaking or it's yep. identity breaking that he literally loses his mechanical shell mm-hmm. around him and his innards and, and becomes a, a spiritual entity right. inside of this spiritual simulation. Right. And it's just weird. It, 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 it was a little bit too long for my taste. Yeah. It, 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 again, Don't like, get me wrong. I got it. I got the whole thing. Like, st- yeah. Studios like to show off like a mm. little bit too much sometimes. And this is, again, one of those instances where it's like, I get it. It's trippy. It's fine. There's colors. It's cool. Which we get another one of these sequences, except inside of this reality, this AI, of them pulling the bug out of him. They're pulling the 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 AI's bug uh, the pre-programming out, he had. Right, out of his reality. But this whole sequence of him finding self-fulfillment, of him finding his own ego, is interrupted because him as a tracker in the real world alerted the main AI unit where this human base was. So they're pulled out of the Matrix and they're like, holy shit, we're being invaded by these giant fucking robots. And there's a badass fighting struggle scene with like the crew members trying to fight off the Sentinels, this other walkers, this other uh, robots. And uh, our our friend Robot here, the one that was getting, you know, beamed into fucking consciousness, uh, he wakes up, wakes up, realizes his girl, Eon Fox character, uh, Flux character, uh, is being taken over and he almost gets mad. And fucking, he kills the robot that was uh, taking her. And there's this, like, two seconds of... She's knocked unconscious. Yes. Everyone else dies. She's knocked unconscious. His way of waking her up was plugging her back into that program. And it almost felt sexually motivated. Yeah. Because yeah. As, 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 as she's getting knocked out and she's looking at, he's looking at her knocked out. He's like, I want to feel her again. I want to I want to see her again like I saw her and I it feels like these only motivations to put her back into the matrix was just to be there spiritually with him. You you know what this part reminded me of? 
And the only part, the only reason it made me think of it is because I jumped on Twitter at the same time that we were watching this episode, it, and I saw a clip of Akame got kill, mm-hmm. and that reminded me of Akame got kill because the motive, the the writing in Akame got kill is it's what I imagine high school DXD is like, but Akame got kill is like a much more dumbed down version where it's like his motivation initially is to plug this girl. He he meets hot sexy girl, teaches him what the real world's actually like, awakens his reality. And that's like what Akame got kills about. That's kind of what this turns into because he plugs her back in, but he's not a real personality. He's not a real spirit. So when she's plugged in, she's unconscious. She wakes up inside of this reality matrix pocket dimension that they made just to awaken AIs. And he tries approaching her. She's scared. She's screaming in horror. She's screaming in horror. She's terrified. And that's how like the episode ends is her scaring herself out of the matrix dimension leaving him there he feels rejected he just like pushed himself away from the ai and the the robot people sentient race that he that made him for this woman and she immediately rejected him afterwards and that's how it ends like there's so many interpretations just from it ending right there that it's like holy fuck within 20 minutes they just pump you with all this fucking shit which is great which is great which cool. which is like all the benefits of like not only this but star wars vision is in the same point absolutely and uh this brings us to our last story yeah, yeah. The, the the very last one jesus is called the final flight of, of the, the osiris. osiris uh osiris being a uh the egyptian god right right mm-hmm. and I, I think osiris he was the god of what Mm, I'm not sure. Uh, it seems like sun, destiny, I don't know. The god death. of the deceased. Oh, there you go, death. Which, more fucking metaphors. Yeah. Because, like, when, when we were watching it, I, I didn't even remember the, 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 the name of the episode, right? I was like, oh, shit, is that the Nebuchadnezzar? Which, like, the Nebuchadnezzar is about... It, it's named like that because it's about traveling through stories, traveling through dimensions, whatever. The the irony of calling it the Osiris is it's just like we're watching an old crew that's a parallel to the Nebuchadnezzar, but they're already dead. Like we're watching a failed Nebuchadnezzar crew in their struggle against the AI, mm-hmm. which like the animation style, it looks like a modern Mortal Kombat game. For all I know. You it know looks I mean? fucking ridiculous, bro. Uh, they animated the stretch marks on the butts. <laughs> they animated, like, your pores and the faces. It the, looks ridiculous. And for 2003, you're like, how? Yeah, exactly. How, like, it how does is my games sense? on my PS5 look less than this? The Mass Effect HD remake doesn't even look this good. This doesn't yeah. make sense. Because, like, Final, Final Fantasy IX didn't even look at this good at the time. And it's it's so crazy because, like, the first sequence is just showing you that, like, hey, we can animate some shit. Because it's a parallel of this woman and this guy training in, like, a martial arts, like, arena program thing, like, in Matrix 1. It's the same kung fu, almost a simulation of the first Matrix. Right, but they're fighting with swords. And then you're just watching them get progressively more naked while they're, like, good at sword fighting. Which is, like, okay, that's cool. Like, I get it. Yeah. And but the the part where it starts getting sad is where it's like they get plugged out of the matrix and they're like, hey, we really are in just this giant magnetic spaceship trying to run away from this AI. So they fail at it like wholesale, like from the first five minutes where it shows you this badass animation fight sequence, the rest of it is just them failing in the real world. And it's it's almost it reminds me of like people that are good at like even video games or Yu-Gi-Oh or something like that, but they're fucking losers in life or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's an escape to show you and make you feel good at something, but your real life is in shambles and them more so because them, their life being in shambles is they're being killed, killed by octopus robots. Yeah. Uh, There's, I mean, I can't tell you much about this episode. I can't think of any, any, actual plot sequence any yeah. actual plot sequence but the animation sequence the the they didn't want to tell you a story no first of all no which is fine they wanted to show you what a crew of the osiris spaceship magnetic hovering space whatever 
is is gonna go through. Mm. And bro, they get into their machine guns, they get into their fucking guns, they start shooting as sentinels, they they plug in this girl back into the matrix to deliver a message, they they go through a whole struggle. It was like the fall of Rome. It was like seeing the Trojan horse getting to the fucking and it leads a lot into the um that like the the end goal should always be the priority, right? Because it's like these people's lives don't matter because they plug back the girl back in the matrix like you're talking about. We see some cool flips, we see some cool animation sequence, which is just to show off the animation again. Mm-hmm. But the end goal is her to drop off a VHS tape, a fucking VHS tape, in, inside of a uh, male drop box so that somebody can get this message, which is probably talking about matrix one or two like the oracle or something that they're going to show neo at some point Mm. about what the agents are doing and where not to go where not where they're being found and how Mm. like the ship's going to get destroyed and she thinks she's about to get unplugged because she calls her boyfriend the the guy that she was fighting in the beginning who's in the real world like laser blasting these octopus robots but dying Mm -hmm. and she's like pull me out pull me out pull me out but he's busy dying yeah so and we see her drop in the matrix which we know it means that she died while she was plugged in. Right, which is it's sad. And it's crazy that like the matrix the animatrix ends with this because we my favorite stories are the ones that are pocket dimensions that make me forget that I'm watching the matrix, which is why I liked World Record so much cuz like it's 20 minutes long, 15 minutes in, I almost forget that I'm watching something about the matrix. Mhm. And here, it, it pulls you back into that. It's just like, hey, all these cool stories, the noir stuff, at the end of the day, humanity was dying trying to get away from this self-created AI, which, sad. Sad all the way around. Super bummed out. But it, that's what makes it good. And I'm really good that we watched the Animatrix. I'm glad you brought this up. I'm excited to talk about Star Wars Visions next week. Absolutely. I mean, we're, we're now we're in 30 minutes into this episode. If we would have talked about Star Wars Visions, we could have gone another fucking three hours. Absolutely. Yeah, but... uh. Great shit. I'm glad we watched it. I'm glad we can have a more connected uh, conversation whenever we get to watch The Matrix 4 or Resurrections. Uh, we're going to be watching Star Wars Visions. Uh, but that was it for this episode, guys. We do recommend you watch this. I At least I will if you're a Matrix fan. If you're not, then you don't really need to. But if you like anime, then watch War Record. Watch uh, the program. Watch... Yeah, you don't have to watch the whole hour and 40 minute thing. It's put into nine sequences for a reason. Like, mm-hmm. that's fine. Mm-hmm. You don't have to learn more about the canon if you don't care. But I think that about wraps up our discussion of Animatrix. Nerd down? Nerd down. Nerd down. Nerd down. Hey, guys. Welcome to the Nerd Den. When the nerds get down. We are here in episode 64? Holy shit. I didn't even know what episode this was. Yeah. I just recorded a whole episode and I didn't even know. Episode 64 between nerds. The Animatrix... It was it was good. It was good to talk about something that was American medium and try to be and they try to translate some of the stories into Japanese medium. It was it was a great conversation. It, it makes me really really excited to talk about Star Wars Visions next week because like like I was saying, I watched all nine episodes this morning. I hate how fucking nerds are as people because we because Star Wars is like the original nerd fandom. Am I right? It's the original sci-fi fandom. Mm-hmm. It's the the fans are in like the original fans are in like the 50s and 60s at this point. Like mm-hmm. these dudes are fucking boomers. Yeah. And they hate it. Hate all the hate mail is coming from a bunch of old ass fucking boomers that are like, why not the best judge of character? <laughs> why why don't they just make a new hope for the 80th time? Like yeah. shut the fuck up, bro. Like the 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 fandom needs to move on at a certain point which you had to reintroduce me to this point which i like forgot george lucas's original motivation for star wars 1979 star wars a new hope was 13 samurai Mm -hmm. which is a a japanese film that came out in the early 70s like almost a decade before star Mm -hmm. wars came out which is a uh it's a western Japanese. Mm, just like the Mandalorian. That's why the Mandalorian was so great. Right. So, like, to say that Star Wars never had its roots in Japanese media is just flat out wrong because yeah. George Lucas has done multiple interviews. Well, he'll say flat out, like, no, dude, like, there's multiple screenshots that are frame by frame, mm-hmm. 13 Samurais, which is, which is great. But I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, I'm sorry I opened up this up mm-hmm. with that. 
Um, but I do want to do some more self plugs right here. Guys, please use hashtag tits for nerds. That's T I T S F O R N E R D S in original tweet or Instagram post to be entered into our October giveaway for every like and retweet on original tweets or Instagram posts that use hashtag tw- tits for nerds. We will be donating to the Rio Grande Con- Cancer Foundation. It is Brands Cancer Awareness Month. We're, we're good fucking people like this and you can win some cool anime shit just by using a fucking hashtag like who doesn't love that mm-hmm. and then send us any of your concerns to our email at between nerds podcast at gmail.com we'll fucking look through anything bro you want to vent into what you that you cried on fruit baskets it's cool all of our social medias are also at between nerds uh even if even the social media platforms that we don't actually post on that often both me and aldo have the push notifications for all these mm-hmm. like on our phones so we'll respond to anything anywhere anytime like, mm-hmm. just hit us up. Because we haven't been getting as much feedback lately, but, like, you, you you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if you guys like the direction we're going. If you don't like the direction we're going, let us know. It, it, we This was originally made to create, like, a community of nerds. And we have no people, <laughs> we have people listening in Germany, in Japan, in Africa. Australia. We're, we're fucking popping in uh, the Dominican Republic for some fucking reason. Mm-hmm. Hit us up. Hit us up. You can write a whole email in Spanish. I don't care. I'll make Aldo translate it. Yeah, I'll translate it. But I won't tell Drew about it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, guys, uh, what else have we got here? You saw Venom 2? I didn't see Venom 2. I saw Venom 2. Venom 2, uh, the thing that I think is really funny about the Sony productions of Venom and Spider-Man and all those is that like they're clearly... They're, n- they're not low production. That's a bad way of putting it. But like the the... There's a lot of background storytelling that's not as flushed out as something with the MCU, mm. which is ironic when you watch like the after credit scene in Venom 2. Like Venom 2 is fun. It's like uh 5.56. It's entertaining. I watched it because Venom was one of my favorite comic book characters in the early 2000s and 90s, especially when he was doing that original comic book run that was super hard to find because nobody fucking bought it and watched it. But like I just loved, love, love, love the character design of Venom. Mm-hmm. I used to go to Chico's Tacos on Dyer here in El Paso with my grandma just to play fucking uh, Capcom versus Marvel. And I would always pick Venom on my team. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because I just love the Venom character model. And um, I, although I'm excited for you to watch Venom 2 and I'm excited to talk about like the after credit scene implications. Mm-hmm. But what I'm also excited about are the implications that are coming out of the popularity of Squid Game, mm-hmm. Netflix's most popular uh, original series ever, mm-hmm. which we we were talking about DNA Productions, and we're talking about the director of uh, um, the Matriculated uh, Animatrix episode, mm-hmm. Peter Chung, and how he's Korean, and how he directed Aeon Flux, and all these other things. And I think it's crazy that, like, for so long, when we thought about the East in terms of, like, entertainment productions, it was always Japan, right? And right now, we're seeing Korea and China come up a lot more because we're seeing a lot more um, anime that are adaptations of Chinese uh, uh, one-way, like mm-hmm. manga, but mm-hmm. Chinese, uh, productions. And we're seeing... A lot of Korean productions in the past, like, three, four years that are winning best fucking film at the Oscars. Best Best foreign film. Best foreign film. Best fucking... um, Original uh, original screenplay. Right. This is the most popular Netflix show ever. Netflix is the number one streaming platform, obviously. I, I heard... And I don't know if this is true, but I was reading a headline on this article that Squid Game boosted white van sales by 700%. Why? Because people are going to be that shit for fucking Halloween. There was a um, a a story that was published about the author of Squid Game that I love. I absolutely adore about Mr. Huang Dong-hyuk and how in like 2009 he wrote the script to Squid Game. And this is around the same time that all the hype about uh, the Hunger Games was happening. Because if you really want to be facetious, Squid Games is kind of Netflix's answer to Korean Hunger Games. Mm. Sort of. It's not. It's not. Mm. But no, like, if not. you want to be facetious, you could interpret it as such. Mm. And there, there's pieces that you could use to like make that argument. And 
what I the the story is he wrote uh, the script in 2009, pitched it to everybody, including Hollywood pro- studios and productions, and in Korea, nobody wanted to pick it up. Absolutely nobody wanted. It. He was flat broke. He had to sell the laptop that he wrote Squid Games on just to pay his fucking rent. Mm-hmm. Which like I feel that struggle too. Like I get it. Mm-hmm. And for him to stick on that grind for 10, 11 years, being like, no, I have something here. I fucking got the gem right here and nobody sees it yet. And he kept he kept riding that train for 10, 11 years to the point that Netflix, who we've talked about on this podcast before, will produce anything. Mm. If it's original and they can buy the rights to it, they will produce anything, anything, anything. It can mm. be the most garbage plot ever. And they'll throw money at it in a live production. Because what one of my favorite parts about the directing style in the Squid Game uh, Netflix show is that they use live props a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. It. Talking about Star Wars, some like <clears throat> why I like the Star Wars prequels so much more than no, the sequels so much more than the prequels is because I like live props even when they look fake. Mm-hmm. Because even when it's CGI, like it looks so much more like intangible. Using live puppets and scene props in Squid Game, it looks so good. It feels so good. And Netflix, because they'll produce anything original if they can buy the rights to it, they kind of lucked out. But it's one of those things where it's like if you put out a wide enough net, you're bound to catch something at some point, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, I'm so glad they did. It's I I love Squid Game. It's so short. It's only, like, six hour-long episodes. I have issues with the ending, but it's because it's a show ending. Mm. It doesn't have a real ending. Like, it's clearly leading up to more, which I don't want to spoil anything for you, Aldo. Mm. Yeah, I've only seen to the, up to the second episode or so. Which, it, episode one is mind-breaking, like, at the time. Like, it, it, at first, like, the first half of episode one, I was like, oh, this is boring. Like, I hate narratives where the protagonist is getting beat the fuck up. Like, I, I hate feeling sad the entire time. Mm-hmm. But... Squid Game in and of itself is so interesting because it's about games. It's about winning. Mm. It's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. Everyone, if you haven't already, like you should watch it. And it's the most popular show in the world. Like no, everyone's probably seen. I, honestly, it. I started watching the. I started watching the show. I, I was in the second episode. I just, I just haven't gotten the chance to watch it. You know, just here up and there doing stuff. You know, but no, I get it. You I know, it. and um. I don't have much to talk about. We, I watch Bond, but I, I would rather save that conversation till you watch. I'll, I'll probably watch it this week, to uh-huh. be honest. I've been looking forward because it's the last Bond film with Daniel Craig. Absolutely. I, I think great, that, great send-off, by the way. Yeah, and he, he... Which, like, this is the third time that they've told us it's the final film with Dan- Daniel Craig. Mm-hmm. But this time, like, I'll believe it because I, I was watching some of the GQ interviews that Daniel Craig was doing. He's old. Like, he, he's tired. Mm-hmm. He's over it. He gets hurt every film production like he, he keeps breaking arms keeps breaking legs and it's I, great i love I, it thank I, you I, I feel for the guy because he's putting out quality work mm-hmm. but something i did want to talk about was netflix finally fine i mean netflix hbo finally put out the initial live action trailer for the uh game of thrones prequel which is going to be about the dance of the dragons mm-hmm and Jay, I, I heard some bad things about. I heard that like the trailer was not played enough times. I heard that. I, I heard a couple of people being like, you know, it, it sucks how bad of a bad taste in your mouth they left you with a finale. That not a lot of people are interested in watching this shit. Yeah, and, and so I'm not so interested in the hype behind it because mm. if it's produced by HBO, they're gonna put money behind it. There's going to be a marketing campaign behind it. And I know at a certain point there's going to be... It's not going to be like Game of Thrones Season 1 where nobody fucking watched it. Like at a certain point, this is one of the... Outside of like Netflix or Hulu, this is one of the biggest original streaming producers like in mm. the game, right? Like mm. This is fucking HBO. Mm. Everybody knows the home box. It's not office. just CP, bro. It's HBO. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and... um I think this also has to do with like a lot of the fans of the A Song of Ice and Fire novels. The game, the the Dance of the Dragons story is not part of the core five six novels. Mm-hmm. This is part of like prequel uh, world building books that George R R Martin has had co written with his blessing. Mm-hmm. So for like lore nerds, this is dope. 
You know, I, I think it'll catch on. I, I did hear what you were talking about, about the initial hype behind it. But I think it'll catch on. I really, really do. Mm-hmm. And just judging from the trailer, which, like, it, I, I watch fucking YouTube channels that interpret tra- trailers. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's one of the things that I didn't pick on pick up on initially is that it's jumping between time periods. It's showing the beginning of the Dance of Dragons. It's showing years later and the consequences to these characters. And it's in a minute and 30 second trailer, it's juxtapositioning, juxtapositioning those sequences. So I'm excited to see what the actual story tells. Because the Dance of the Dragons, it's it's funny that HBO picked that story. Because one of my biggest gripes about the Game of Thrones show and how they interpreted the Song of Ice and Fire was they marketed the clearly gimmicky things, which is like dragons, it's fire, it's the fighting, when like the A Song of Ice and Fire novels were not about that. It was about the power play, about, about the politics. It's the fucking... Cloud messy and all this stuff. Right. It's about... It's, it's House of Cards, but Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. which is not what the show turned into at a certain point. So I'm interested to see how like they've been given... The Dance of the Dragons, where there's eight dragons alive at one time, when in the entirety of the Game of Thrones there's only three, but how they relate that to the best parts of storytelling when it comes to a Song of Ice and Fire, which like they may or may not do it right. I might mm. be regretting these words at a certain point, but for now I'm excited. It's HBO, you know. It is HBO. Yeah, you know, we. I'm willing to try an HBO show. And but, um, well, the um, something else I did want to talk about briefly, which I have nothing to talk about about it, is just that I'm excited to watch the A24 production. Lamb, they came out this weekend. Yeah, A24. And uh, it's funny because you'll see some people, especially some women, being like, oh, the A24 is the new Quentin Tarantino for boys. You know? Hmm, I've never heard that. You know, like, A24 movies are good. They're trippy. Right. There's something else. It's not regular Hollywood. Right, which is, like, the point. Yeah, which is the point. Exactly. Which, like, it's ironic that, like, if you had had this conversation like 20 years ago, there were so many blockbuster films, but they were all different blockbuster films. As opposed to now, they're all MCU or comic book films, so everything's kind of like tunneled down. Mm. So I get what you're saying, that it's like, this is the only way, A24 Studios is the only way we get out of the box storytelling in film. Absolutely. And they made some great stuff. Uh, I think I'm going to go watch it on Tuesday, so I'll be, I'll be up to date with Lamb. Okay, no. I, I I'll probably watch uh, James Bond this week. I don't know if I'll watch Lamb this week. I do want to watch it ASAP though. Mm-hmm. So who knows? But yeah, that's all I had to talk about for this little nerd down sequence. If anybody has anything else you want us to break down, not in a full episode format or anything you just want our brief opinions on or something like that. Again, like Aldo was saying earlier, please hit us up on our email on social media. Whatever, we'd love to hear from you. And we'll break it down in the nerd down. Yeah, absolutely. And that's all I've had for episode 64 of Between Nerds. So this has been Between Nerds.